On to our program, discussion of the Mason County Budget 2018. We have as our guest speakers, the Mason County Department Heads. We have Karen Herr, the Auditor, Melody Peterson, the Assessor, and Karen Frazier, the Treasurer. Lisa. Lisa. Karen's in. I'm sorry, Lisa. <laughs> um, let's see. I have a couple of things to pass out. One is from Cindy Schatz, and she did uh, an analysis of all the department payroll. All from Mesa County website, department pages, August financial report 2018, preliminary budget summary, and current expenses. But this is all the uh, salaries. Uh, for 2017 and 2018 proposed budget. So that's this that's coming around. And this was a little bit money, money up program. I kind of uh, messed it up a little bit because I thought Cowlitz County was a comparable county and, and I found out that they're really not. So um, probably shouldn't pay attention to that. Um, so it's just got some kind of glossary information on it. And then the recommendations for the 2011 budget study, which was done by Brenda. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Brenda. Okay, and then it was a team that did the budget study last time. So the one in 2011. Mm -hmm. So I've got um, about 30 copies of these charts that I'll pass around. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have enough for everyone, so it may be that we have to, to share some of them. Um, so I'll just give that a minute to, to get to everybody. But um, when we did the budget study back in um, 2010, Michelle Bell, Linda, I think, Linda, you were part of it, and who else is still there, is still here that was part of that? It's been such a change in, in our uh, yeah, membership. Yeah, I met they did Yeah, yeah. So. there have been um, uh, funds or uh, programs that were transferred out of special funds as we saw it in 2011 and they're now in current expense and examples are MACECOM, uh, risk management um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank there's, there's a couple more uh, non-paid uh, accrued leave is is now in the, the uh, current expense account so what I needed to do to to normalize that I took about three million out that's just a shot at it be 
because going from apples to apples on this was a little tricky in comparing 2011 to 2018, and that's in part why I said earlier that we really need an update on, on the charts if we're going to leave them on, the, on our website. So, bottom line here, the assessor has lost 10% compared to 2011, and I, I want to uh, hasten to add that the 2018 may be adjusted somewhat as the commissioners uh, finalize uh, the budget. There's a little bit of wiggle room that there may be some additional dollars added. But as it stands, the assessor will have lost 10% in seven years, the auditor 4%, the treasurer 2%, the sheriff and traffic policing will have gone up 20%, all other gone, will have gone up 17%, that all other there includes all the courts and uh, the prosecutor and uh, you know there's just a lot in that um, and then so bottom line it may appear that we have 28 percent more in current expense expenditures for 2018 but really it's, it's not that much more because you've got to take out the three million that just came, you know, it, it came over from special funds and it's going out. So there's really not that much of an increase over this seven year period. In fact, it's, it's about 16% is the increase. And then on the second chart, um, what we're looking at there is the percent of total expenditures. So in 2011, and I, I found this to be uh, quite informative. Uh, in 2011, the uh, assessor had the assessor's expenditures as budgeted were five percent of the total expenditures, and in 2018 it would be four percent. And then you just go down and and look at this. So the sheriff as a percent of total is 38%, and in 2018, if it stands as currently um, briefed last um, Wednesday, I believe was the workshop, the sheriff would have uh, 40%. So those are just, uh, uh, that's just a couple of different ways to look at um, the funding. Right now, on the sheriff, does that include the diversion money of 1.5 million? It's the yes, traffic policing is the uh, diversion money. Now, traffic policing is where uh, the largest part, the largest portion of the sheriff's increase has come from, from the diversion dollars, traffic policing. So, any questions there? I hope I haven't confused you. What is traffic police in. So, can you explain that for us, Randy? There's a provision in the law that allows you to take certain monies from the road department to be used for the sheriff's department for specific, a list of specific duties or jobs that have to do with the roads uh, and traffic policing. So that would be DUIs, Accident investigation. Ac accident investigation, stuff like that, uh, speeding. But there's also things we were just going over as a commission that include uh, something done to a sign, uh, doing investigations on, on the signs and the damage that occurs to it uh, right away uh, if, it's, if it's directed by uh, uh, somebody from the road department, basically the engineer. There's a whole list of things. We can get you that list. It was just an issue to us as well. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's, I, I just uh, want to rec uh, recommend that, that we plan on uh, doing an update of um, 2011 budget study. And the second thing that I, I want to recommend is, um, I believe the county needs a citizen's advisory board to, you know, or committee to make recommendations on the budget and to help to inform the public because I think one of the great outcomes that we had from that last budget study was we went around and we briefed it. Well, lots of people came to us and said, we and I had no idea the difference between 
current expense and the special funds. So there, there, if, if there was a citizens advisory committee, then there could be more people could learn and understand what's going on, you know, with our with our county money. So that's all I have to share. That's a great idea, Brenda. Um, maybe we should talk about the yeah. Do you have any comments on that? I'd like to make a comment. Uh, uh, just a general comment. Uh, the Citizens Budget Committee is a good idea. It's a half step where a full step is needed. Uh, you have to bear in mind that until you have an intimate knowledge of the departments, the operations of the departments, you shouldn't draw any firm conclusions just on the budget numbers until you know exactly the, uh, the, all the aspects of the departments that that budget money is providing for. Um, it's, it's easy to look at numbers and say, oh, look at this great increase here. That's where our trouble is. I think, I think one would, would uh, just caution people uh, before they make any staff decisions to know uh, exactly uh, where those monies are going and why. Because this is a moving top target. These situations and these duties are changing from year to year for the different departments. So thank you. May I ask a question? Where are jail expenses in this? That's in the sheriff's. Okay. And, and you know, uh, I think you make a good point there, Tom. Um, I thought this gave us a point of departure. It, it, it shows us here is where, where we were in 2011, and this is where we are with the proposed 2018. When we did the uh, 2011 budget study, we spent many, many hours um, in interviews with uh, the elected officials and department heads, and um, so I will I will readily admit that many many changes have made been made um, within the organization of the county commissioner since 2011. There are a lot of changes there. We have to say that we made a series. I recall reading over the the study is that we made a bunch of. Suggestions. And I think I can do All right. Well, I guess um, there's a question. Oh, I'm Hi, I'm Jeannie Raywald, and I have a question about the departments and how much grant funding they're bringing in. Because if we could see that, that would show, you know, a small percentage maybe comes from the county, but they're doing a lot of work because they're leveraging other funding. So, so So should we continue with the rest of our program? Yes, yeah, please. And introduce Karen Hurl, who will talk about the auditors. Okay. Um, first, I would like to just uh, comment on the information that Brenda just uh, passed around. And it doesn't surprise me. I've been saying this for a while. It's like in my office, uh, yearly increases uh, between three and a half and five percent. So um, not only did we not increase our budget, but we have been going back um, since 2011, since I was elected, like 2007. And it really justifies why I've been so outspoken about um, my opposition of across the, across the board cuts. Um, it is the worst way to balance the budget. They are not fair, um, they are not just, and this is the reason why. A cost of board cuts doesn't take into consideration the departments that have received very healthy or at least acceptable increases over the last five, six years, and which departments have not. It doesn't take into consideration which departments year after year do not extend their budget authority and which departments barely have enough to cover their last payroll. It doesn't take into consideration which departments year after year submit anticipated revenues that are rarely met but used to justify the requested expenditures and which department meets or exceeds their revenue expectations every year. It doesn't take into consideration which departments are required by law to provide mandated services and which departments do not. And this is a huge sticking point for me because those two are vastly, vastly different. And it doesn't take into consideration the discretionary funding that is requested and received by some departments while others have not. 
not all departments have been or treated equal. Um, and uh, I think it's much more difficult to take these into consideration, but that it, it would be my uh, yeah, my wish. Um, I have been kind of asked to, to talk to you about what the consequences are going to be on the office. Um, in 2000, uh, when I took office in 2007, I had 16 and a half employees. The following year, um, when uh, the economy tanked in 2008, I lost three employees. Every year, I have uh, pretty much uh, it's been a slow drip. I keep losing employees. Every year since I have been auditor, um, the request from the Board of County Commissioners uh, to submit my preliminary budget has always come with guidelines, um, either to submit it with no additional um, increases or to decrease it, and I have always uh, done my best to follow those instructions. I do not think it's done, <laughs> done me any favors because by the time this crisis hit, um, I was already at rock bottom and my back was against the wall. So, um, we have been uh, requested to reduce 17.5% um, starting in July of this year. It actually is more like about 21% because we were also asked to absorb um, all uh, any increases for 2018 along with the 17 and a half. And that's another 3.5%. Like all salary increases, all benefit increases, all operational costs. Um, so, in July, most of our departments did uh, comply with their request and we had to uh, reduce uh, about 7.5%. I lost another employee. Um, I asked some employees to reduce their hours, subsequently their, their uh, staff, their salaries, on a voluntary basis. I lost all of my extra health and elections that we have um, yearly and then are trained uh, to help us process ballots. Um, I have uh, pretty much uh, eliminated all discretionary funding that was left in my budget. Um, and um, I, and that was pretty tough because that was only for like five months. I had to reduce my budget by about a little over $100,000. Um, they just informed me today before I came, um, financial services, that uh, I probably don't have enough money to make it through you know, like this year um, based on that. Um, I am prepared for and I'm willing to pay for um, office supplies and my bond and any travel, anything out of my pocket uh, so we can survive. Um, for 2018, we had to uh, Submit uh, another about 13 percent decrease. It's going to be at least another two employees. I will be down to nine employees. That's almost half of what I had when I took office. Um, obviously, we're going to reduce hours to the public. Um, we are going to. Um, there is nothing left in my budget that's discretionary. Um, none. none. I have no cell phones, I have no phones, we have no travel, we have no training, we have no dues, we have no registration. And again, if that is actually required, we will pay for it out of our own pocket. Um, we have some really tough choices to make. I mean, it, it, it's, they're not easy choices. Um, I, my biggest anxiety is I have enough staffing to provide as mandated services that I am required by federal and state law. Um, that, that gives me, you know, my, my choices are tough. I, I am responsible for four departments. Uh, elections, financial services, recording, and licensing. Three of those are mandated. Elections, financial services, and um, recording. Um, they're mandated, which means regardless of how many staffing, I still need to meet those deadlines. I cannot say, um, we're not going to have an April election because I just don't have enough staffing. I can't say I'm not going to issue payroll because one of my staff members are um, upset. I can't say we're not going to pay the county bills. And I have to report on demand because when real estate documents are brought to our office, all the calculations ought to be done. If you've ever bought a house, you know, you can't make the, the next day all those calculations would be wrong, so it's on demand. Um, however, uh, licensing is not mandated. 
I contract uh, with the state Department of Licensing to provide those services to Mesa County. County. And in turn, I have a contract with two sub agents uh, in Mason County that we oversee, that we do, that we provide all the training and supplies, etc. I have considered um, terminating that contract because I don't think I have the nine employees are enough for to spread over four departments. But what that would result in is I would also have to uh, shut down two businesses in Mason County because the two sub agents have contracts with me. They will not, uh, they cannot have it with the state. And that would require everyone here and everybody in Mason County to go to another county to get their tech renews and, and do their licensing, process their licensing. Um, and we bring in revenue for the, for the, the county in licensing. That's not a good choice, but I, I'm getting, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, but my choices aren't very good. Um, I, I, I can't even tell you, uh, it's the middle of November, I can't even tell you um, um, exactly what I'm going to do and what the consequence will be. Um, I, I can tell you that it will be difficult, but we will do our very best to survive. Um, that I can share with you right now. Karen, this is obviously really affecting you, and I'm sure the other two as well. I, I just can't imagine what you guys are going through, knowing that you have to lay off staff, and that you have to say, sorry guys, you have to bring your own toilet paper or whatever. Um, it's, is there any silver lining that you can see as far as making these cuts and having a balanced budget you know, in the future? Is it, is it like if you balance it, if you do this now, if you make this drastic cut now, is it going to help in the future that you can, can you even predict that? I think it's really different comparing my office and then the county. Yeah, the county needs to start adopting, you know, a balanced budget. No doubt about it. I wish this would have started about three years ago when we knew that there was a decline where it would have been right now and I think we could have made more provisions. Um, when you lose staffing, that is, yeah, is, um, you have two years experience, it, and things level out, to hire somebody back, I mean, even in, in, in licensing, it takes two years before someone can work in a station without supervision. It, it, there is so much experience that walks out that door. Um, it, it, the public will see it to a point, but they have no idea the backlog, what, you do when the customer is not right in front of you. That we have worked so hard to um, streamline and to make efficient that it's just going to erode and you're back to just survival. And survival mode is not very beneficial to the taxpayers that pay their money uh, for these services and, and when they call to find out when something was recorded and when they get back, well, all you're doing is just trying to keep your head above water and. Uh, instead of having to take enter in the computer, you're going back and going through these boxes trying to find that one that they're desperate to get, which takes more time. And it just snowballs. I think it's going to take a long time for my office to be covered with something like this. Is this a time for comments? Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest that you do not purchase anything out of pocket. If you need paper, walk two floors down and get it or one floor down and ask the commission office for it. And my philosophy on this is that if anybody is spending pocket money for necessary supplies, it ought to be the elected officials. I am elected official. And it is the law that if I exceed my budget, it comes out of my pocket. That's the law. Yeah. Is that true yeah. of any elected yeah, official? Yeah, do you want to explain a little bit more? Yeah. Elected official. And, and I, I did just get the uh, printout from um, financial services when I came, and it appears that every department that actually uh, reduced their budget 100% of what the commission asked are in jeopardy of doing just that. Those that declined will be okay. So that would be true even of the sheriff. Any more 
questions specifically for Karen. We'll revisit um, these. <coughs> so Melody Peterson is our assessor, and she will present her presentation. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I'll try to try to speak so that everyone can hear me. But it's the same frustration that during the downturn of the economy, we all pulled together and we cut where we could to make it through because no one knew where that was going to end. And then as we started coming back out of it, you know, we started rebuilding the programs that we started and the efficiencies that we were looking to have in each of our offices. And uh, I don't know about you, but I still wasn't back where I needed to be. And now it's just all collapsing again, and it's, it's, it's very stressful because I myself have taken on work of employees that I've had to reduce hours. Uh, I don't have, I'm, it's just plain simple. I don't have enough staff to do the job that I would appreciate if I was a taxpayer. I want to do the very best that I can and not being able, oh, I'm sorry, I am, aren't I? <laughs> Um, but I mean, the, the people that elected us, you know, it's like they elected me to do this really good job, and that's just what I want to do. I want to do the best job that I can, and, and to not be able to do it is very frustrating. And I know there's certainly a lot of uh, conditions around it that I'm totally out of control in, and will, depending on where these cutbacks end up, I may lose another um, one point, or you know, probably a 1.5 FT. Say for certain now that's going to happen, and we will be dealing with. I have uh, two unions in my office, and we have to be dealing with each of those and all the consequences that will come of having to reduce hours. We're certainly looking at reducing hours to the public because I have to give these people some time to get their work done when they're not answering the phone or uh, they're at the counter answering questions. And we will also, as a parents' office, and I'm sure Lisa's office. We're going to see that backlog start building up again. And if anybody has ever come back out of a backlog of work, it just seems like it takes forever. And we have, we do the senior exemption program for the state, and, uh, you know, and we do the segregation of property, and we change names on all of the sales and occurs and call uh, the county for real estate. All of that will be behind because we just can't keep pace with it. And still do everything else. It's Fired up, and then my appraisal staff has to go out. We have to appraise a certain amount of the county every year, and probably it's usually between nine and ten thousand parcels, and that's a lot of work. And they've got to be out there. They don't even have cell phones anymore. But you guys are on your own. We can't afford cell phones for them, so they go out with their own cell phones, and, and that puts them in an interesting situation too. And, uh, so it, yeah, we're just frustrated. It's like. I know these two of them want to do such a great job, and it's frustrating when you can't do the job that everyone deserves. How many parcels uh, are you assessing every year? It's around, uh, it's between nine and 10,000. The county is um, divided up into six uh, physical inspection areas. And so they're all a little different. But how many parcels are we talking about total? Oh gosh, if my math doesn't work out. <laughs> It depends. Of course, it's ever changed. I don't have my glasses. Oh, um, so, so in 2016, we had um, 58,178 parcels. I don't have 17 number. That's a 16. And some of them are personal property accounts, different things that we deal with a little differently. And how many appraisers do you have? Right now, I have four in the field, and then we have to do an analysis of the whole county too. So. We could only physically inspect the six of the county, but you still have to visit everything else. You have to look at the numbers, you have to look at the sales, you have to physically go out and take pictures of the sales. And then we also the board of equalization, which is two to three hundred uh, parcels a year. We have to prepare a, uh, a defensive value tape to the board of equalization. We have um, different board of equalization, the state board of tax appeals, and that's another takes time to do all those. So, and yeah, the new construction, did you mention new construction also? Yeah, that may, uh, you know, that's what we do at the end of the year, and we may not be in the position to be able to pick up um, all of the new construction every year, which is beneficial to all the taxing districts, which would be a loss of revenue. It would be a loss of revenue. Can I ask a question? Do you have an estimate of what impact 
this is head of the infrastructure. By revenue stream? Yeah. We really, <laughs> we don't directly have revenue except for when people apply for a, uh, maybe a timber program. So our revenue is very limited, but it is, the revenue is out there. We're just creating the values for the properties. To, uh, right, but that them. affects the, the revenue stream for the county. Yes, it would if we don't pick up the new construction. Right, so I was wondering if you had an estimate of what kind of impact that these reductions would have on the county. I do not. Okay. Okay. Um, so I didn't bring it up with you, but this is my 2016 report to the citizens. I want to find an issue every year, so if you share, it would be awesome. And if you want to copy it, it's on my county website. Um, it talks about you know, what the treasurer's office does, and that, um, basically my office is the bank for the county. Um, but not just for the county, for all the school districts, the fire districts, the water districts, and other communities and local government. So my office just does not operate for Mason County in itself, but for the whole county and all of the taxing districts in the county, I am their treasurer. We receive all of their revenue um, just through my office. It all has to be accounted for, received, and managed, um, invested, and so forth. So this is a breakdown, and, and you can read it. Um, but you know, we do exist as a constitutional um, officer of Washington State, and we're here to you know to provide separation of um, duties, you know, between the assessor, the treasurer, the auditor, and the legislators, a legislative portion of the county. So, um, I had um, nine employees in 2016. In 2017, um, we were given reductions. Um, I now have eight employees this year. Um, I did not have to lay somebody off if they left my employment. I was not able to fill that position. Um, cuts for 2018, and again, I echo all those things that Karen said and Melody says. Um, I'll be down to six employees on the current expense, and then I will have one employee that's paid out of a special fund that will handle only property tax and foreclosure process. Um, you know, and you've, and you've, you know, we have 58,000 parcels that we manage. Um, so all of those require a tax statement, mailed. Um, people can elect to get those electronically, but very few do. Um, but they are mailed. So um, as you probably heard, postage is going up again in 2018. That's not a budget for in the budget. Um, again, same criteria. Guidelines come to us every year with what we can and cannot include in our budgets. Uh, we do have some discretion. We are assuming and have been assuming all of the increases for our employees um, and all of our operational expenses. Um, I will not be paying for my own toner or my own paper or out of my personal budget, um, but we won't be buying it either. I mean, have to do other things. But I think by elected officials and department heads paying for things out of their own pockets, now you're underestimating what the county's expenses are for the year and you still don't have a true budget. That's what's been yeah. great. You know, we aren't showing what you truly need to operate this county. So it's hard to go out to the elected or out to the citizens and say we need more money because you're seeing an under you're seeing the expenditures that don't include what we did it with 31 million. Well, it's actually should be 38 and 39, but we cut and cut and cut and cut, and we're paying 33. You don't see that. So now you're underestimating what the county's actual expenses are to operate. That's the way to do this inside. Um, so yeah. Um, I'll be moving to another employee. We will require a lot. Um, there will be somebody to answer the phone. So I'll be down to one cashier at the counter. So if you come in to pay your property taxes, you're going to have lines. So if you 
class longer process property tax payments that come in the mail. That affects revenue because that money is not going into the bank in a timely fashion, but it's being invested. So um, there could be an impact, a small, I don't think it's going to be major, but a small impact, and they're getting hands. But without the staff to do that, it's going to take us long to the process. We have <coughs> questions of electronic things that help make our job easier, but it still takes a body to input, input data all the time. And it took doesn't do it automatically. So there has to be a body there to do it. Um, I've always been a working treasurer, so when I say I have nine staff members, you know, that includes me. I'm already doing, you know, that camp and somebody falls sick on that front counter. I mean, I'm already working every day in my office getting the job done. My bigger concern is going to be, you know, those things that the public comes to expect from us in a timely fashion. One of the things my office does is property tax refunds. So if your property is misassessed for some reason or you get a senior citizen exemption and your property taxes are lower and you're due a refund, you know, we can usually have those out within 30 days. I don't know what that's going to look like when that backlog is going to build. Um, so it, it's really, really and it's going to impact not just the county um, and the other departments in the county and the taxpayers, but every district that I am in for. So, that's where it is. But I have met, every time the measures have come to me, I have met or exceeded you know, what they are asking my office to do. And unfortunately, the answer is going to be no from now on because we're just not going to make it. We're going to go in the queue to be done when it can be done. So, unfortunately, yeah, I'm really concerned about what the backlogs are. I, I see that you guys are facing this sort of spiral that if you can't give good customer service, the customer, the citizen, begins to resent government. Government's bad, they don't answer the phone, they don't get my check out to me when they're supposed to, they do the wrong thing. And then they want less to have their taxes in. We really need to do something to interrupt that in Mason County. And I think there's a certain amount of blame that goes on to the elected officials, the specific elected officials. Um, and people will say, well, you're just not efficient enough for us. And so we need somebody else to administer this because you're just not doing the job. And then there goes all that experience, and we're in even more there's struggle the, than ever started. There's the brain drain. Uh, five years ago, when we uh, had left the Falcon Road, we closed the uh, the three offices for lunch hour, and that continued about almost two years. Um, so we did, we definitely have to reduce the hours to the public now to get the work done, but. My staff and all of our staff came to us and said, please don't close for lunch hour. And the reason why, if you, in all of our offices, but in my office, if you have a licensing transaction, it can take 20 minutes. So you're going to have five people in line when, you know, then you, then you close. And so then they're staggered, so they leave. And so when you, you know, they get a, a, a lunch hour, and so, They'll never get a whole, either they don't have an entire an hour for lunch, or when they come back, there's going to be one person that has, that's going to get a counter. Then you open the door, and every person out there that's been waiting for 50 minutes to come in complains because we're closed and is very angry. So you go through that entire, all those people, because now they've got a chip on their shoulder, and you have one person, which is worse, because you're supposed to really have three, but they couldn't get out for. They said it's worse than if we just work through lunch and have our sandwich right there, basically. So I think if we're going to reduce hours, it's going to be nine to four to the public, which won't affect the public as much, which is good for them. And it will give us um, opportunity to um, get some of the backlog, the, the data entry and things in the computer um, when the doors are closed and maybe we won't answer the phone. But it will also, we're going to have staffing taking reduction in hours and that will help 
Um, so that, but that is very true. That's exactly what happens. There's a lot of anger when they do see a reduction in services, and they do not want to hear that we don't have enough employees to help. Right. Uh, in fact, I instructed my staff oh, not to right. say anything about it. Just do what you can. Walk away. Yeah, I was trying to get. Um, so, Lisa, your staffing. Did you take a staffing cut when the Great Recession occurred? I did. How many did you lose? I lost one then. You lost one? One, and then the extra help that we have in our budget for tax dollars. So you lost one. How many did you lose? Well, I'm going to guess at least one. I would have to go back and check. Yeah, but at least one. <coughs> did you that, lost in the Great Recession? Yeah, the Great Recession. Yeah. It was three or three and a half. Yeah. And at that time, it was, um, yes, <laughs> I was specifically, um, that's cool. the, uh, at that time I was uh, pretty new and I was, uh, this, they just wanted my department to take one more and then one more and it was coming from um, one area. And so I went to the prosecutor and I said, can they do this? You know, can, can they keep reducing just my office just because I don't know, maybe I'm outspoken. I don't know. <laughs> There's a reason why. And um, he said, absolutely. He goes, they can, yeah. I said, how, how, how many more can they take? You know, I can't. And he said, the county commissioners, you know, if they're in charge of the budget, they can reduce you to you, Karen. And then, you know, you can do with what you have to, or you get recalled if you can't, you know, provide the services. But yes, uh, they're, you know, they, they can. They just can't tell you which they had done. They, they wanted this one person gone out of my office, and that's what they couldn't do. But um, so I was hit pretty hard. Okay, I'm not sure who this question is for. Um, is any consideration given in budget to being able to adequately provide state mandated? services. So I'm thinking of mailing, I'm thinking of elections, I'm thinking of assessment, all of these things that really the state requires be done. Does that get considered in putting budgets together? In well, our, our office, we included a letter from the Department of Revenue that indicated that our office should be adequately funded. That is totally up to the county commission to make that determination. And so do you consider that, county commissioners? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. The, here's the, the issue that comes with that, though, is every single department has the same claim. Uh, the district court, you know, they have to have their stuff that's the law. They have to have a insurance part. They have to have their stuff that's the law. But yes, we do consider There's a question over Bobby or Jason. Yeah, Bobby. I recruited because they were fabulous employee in another 
another business. And so I talked them into coming to work for the county, and they have been excellent. Um, they are a sole breadwinner of their family. They have, you know, some real health issues in their family that they need that insurance. And it, it does. It get very personal. It's very, it's tough. It's just tough. And I'm not going, and we're, we're all experiencing that. So I have never worked for county government, but I have worked for the state legislature. And the counties, um, depending on the politics of any county, have a hard time raising revenue in their county. The legislature in Olympia seems, in some respects, to have no trouble setting regulations in their counties. And that's what your lobbyist steps in and says, hold it, we don't have this, you know. Don't give us, we're not going to be able to raise the revenue to do all those specific regulations, the required activities that the state legislature is laying on counties. So there's always the push and pull about, you know, what's right for all the counties. And the state legislature can say that because they don't live in the counties. The state will be able to look at the statewide revenue. Non mandated. Yes. So, so, so I don't know your collective years in Mason County, how many years you've been here, but um, you know what works here. You know who the people are here, you know where their land is. Um, you, so is there somebody talking about these regulations that, I mean, are they all fabulous regulations that the state legislature set on you or the federal government set on you? Are they making the place kind of a better place to live and a safer place to live and more efficient place to live? And is somebody talking about whether these regulations are really costly and you can't raise the revenue to make? So each of us belongs to a, a state organization, the county, et cetera, treasurer, federal association of treasurers, um, and get under the umbrella of uh, association of county officials. We spend more time during the legislative process trying to undo bills that are going to hurt us um, than we do promoting good legislation. I mean, there's just so many things out there that we're holding the bills saying, wait a minute, do you actually know what this is going to do to us? They don't um, and, and so forth. So we spend an inordinate amount of time as organizations and um, doing that, you know, defending ourselves against legislation that is really going to end up costing um, To the um, question about grant revenues, there's absolutely no grant revenue to um, for the treasurer's office. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> and, and the districts that I'm a treasurer for do not pay for my services. They are not charged. I am under state law and I'm their treasurer and there's no mechanism under state law for me to charge my services to them. There are a few exceptions to that, but there are special situations and not just the general daily banking, you know, investment, billing and collecting. Those things are not charged to the district or to the treasurer. All of that comes out of the expense of this. The uh, legislature, uh, it's, uh, to give you the example, this last year, they uh, passed a law that every county had to um, put up more ballot boxes in their county, uh, depending on if there was a census-designated post office in that area um, and by population. Um, without any funding that, goes on with that. They love to mess with election laws, trust me, that they all live and breathe there. So we're exactly what Lisa said. We're always fighting that it's like thousands of dollars. These things are like, you know, made from Fort Knox. They're really expensive. They're expensive. We had to, you know, install them. We have to now, and in places, one place, that really is not necessary. Um, and um, every election now, we have to send out more staffing, which now we have less staffing, to go pick up the ballots, and and you can hardly keep up with the legislature. When they're in, in session, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way, I'm like, to our three legislators, do you know how this will impact our office or our county? That's all I can really do, you know, and, but it doesn't, they don't pay uh, in consideration, just 
what the ramifications are going to be that we have to live with. They're making laws up here. It sounds good, but in reality, it's just another layer of, of uh, things for us to do in a different way. Um, yes, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's so they won't. My experience, they may not put money in the budget. There may be an expectation that somehow Mason County can raise the revenue. <laughs> oh yeah. And I, I know enough about Mason County to know they're not going to raise the revenue. Nobody came with that. Uh, you know, I'm recalling when um, there was a big um, uh, FTE reduction back it was before the Great Recession, that there was a there was a large reduction. Recall that? And as I'm remembering, we didn't, the county didn't budget correctly for the unemployment that had to be paid when the employees go off the rolls. I'm concerned about that now. Yeah, that's, that, was a, that was a considerable bill that was like, oh, wow. And so the employees may leave, and you may lose, you know, not have to pay that uh, salary, but you're going to have to pay the unemployment. And um, that's something that I hope is the reductions. Where is that? Where would you find that in the? Is it in your budget or is it somewhere else? The unemployment. It's the non-departmental. Okay. Well, that's going to be higher than um, 32 million, then, huh? We each carry in our budgets a portion when we were charged so much per employee. It's not part of our permanent budget that goes back into that. Norman, you want some? Well, I just want to read it. I'm not very savvy about county government, but much has um, different organizations. You said you, you need to belong to an association of state auditors or county auditors and so on. Do they have lobbyists that are actually yeah. present as a state legislature and make comments like this is such a great idea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do you expect us to implement this particular humanity? And so, how does that go down? We always count ourselves lucky when it comes to what we consider bad legislation doesn't make it through. Um, we think we're doing a good job. Um, but there are a lot of important things that we'd rather be spending our time in that's you know, good legislation. It doesn't go through either because we're, you know, so busy different than the other. Um, so it's a give and take, but you know, we do count our blessings. We can also ourselves go and we have a call and in the uh, uh, country legislature and testify um, on behalf of our association or our office. Yeah. Um, and we hope it does good. Yeah. I worked for a bit as a volunteer with the police department in the city. And I was doing filing and some Do does the law allow volunteers in any of your office? Are there tasks they could do? Um, have you used volunteers in the past? And I'm thinking drivers to pick up ballots, uh, data entry. Yes. But I don't know if the law allows it with the, the areas you type in. We used to have volunteers. And um, that was um, stopped by HR. And uh, we have unions. You know, everybody in my office is a union. And, uh, based on that fact, I had to no longer use volunteers to take them. I was thinking that would be great to ask for the only voters to do. You go around and pick up ballots. Or I you were just mentioning that you laid off a couple of um, people I was thinking about that would be great for us to do. But they won't allow it. But then you need somebody to manage your volunteers, and so that was one of their great staff uh, I think could someone to talk a little bit about budget process in general, what's going on right now, our bottom line, our special, all, all the things that, that are coming due in December and how that's all looking. Um, I don't know that any of us can answer that question right now. I've turned in what they have requested for additional budget cuts. So, where are those coming from? I don't, I don't know that we will see anything before the hearing in December.
that was why we had asked one more time how many MPEs would be lost so that we could know the exact amount. As we look at the budget requests, and now I'm getting, I'm sorry, I'm kicking. But when we look at the budget, I look at a budget request, it's unclear to me at all times. I, I tried to think about how much it would cost in backfill and make whole one particular department. And there were new positions added, which would impact the, the benefits, and I couldn't make those differentiations. And so it was difficult for me to come up with a really precise number for that department. That was my hope in asking what specifically would need to be cut. This was a very a pretty a more precise number, but I understand the reticence to do such. And, and, and I'm not blaming anybody. I was just trying to, for my own purposes, to get down to really precise numbers. Hey, Rhoda, uh, I'm sorry, Rhoda's, oh, yes. uh, I would just, first of all, uh, I think we all agree you had the amazing job you have done in your departments. I mean, it's our, it touches our lives daily. And I go into those offices, and I'm, I never cease to be amazed that you do. And then with the restricted resources, it's, it must be just such a nightmare. And I just wonder, what is the reason these are such key, um, these are key departments for us? What is the reason they get cut? I mean, I, the county doesn't have enough money to pay for these key departments. What is the reason the, expense, the money goes to other areas? What is there an answer to that question? Um, I, I just want to say that this, this sounds really dire. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's time for a total reorganization of something here. Because it's, it's at crisis point, it sounds like, in our county. I took this question. Law and justice and criminal justice and public health are, are always the public's first priority. And I think that I mean we're behind the scenes for the most part nobody wants to come pay their property taxes <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants someone else that's their assessed value um Karen you know she they value that you know she's running an election but they don't see all the behind the scenes and that's what these three offices do we're behind the scenes functioning for everybody else it doesn't happen without us but out to the public and you say the treasurer's office he needs two new employees and you're not going to get a new deputy to come when you call them where what choice do you make i mean the public's perception is not that you know i need to get another employee or i need the employee that i have to provide those services they want people on the street protecting them. They want a health department that's protecting them. And I think mean, we all understand that, you know, as elected officials. And we understand our taxpayers, you know, perception of government and what's important to them. Um, and I think, you know, we've had conversations with people have stepped up and well, yeah, you know, we would pay for increasing those things. But I think what we find is there's a backlog or there's not a good decision-making process really enough at the top level of the legislative government that are making decisions in time and fashion to educate the taxpayers on what it is we're really asking for. Yes, we get that has happened sooner. I mean, we've been having these discussions for over you know, two years that this was going to be a problem. We need to make decisions. They always come at the last minute. And I really, you know, I think it was brought up earlier, it was discussed and talked about, and, and the public was educated about why we need these monies for the things you want, as well as the things that, you know, we need. So. Tom, you had something? You know, I, I just wanted to make the obvious observation that without these three department heads here, there wouldn't be a county because that's where the money flows. It flows for the, for the generation and the collection services of these three departments. Uh, without them, uh, the, money, the money stops. It's not where you want to build a bottleneck. 
obviously you want the money to flow to the various departments and you want to get to the source of that money and you don't want to restrict the flow of that money. I mean, if you just look at it in economic terms, I had made the argument a couple of weeks ago at a meeting that that's not where you want to cut. Now, I don't want to suggest where you should cut, but that's not where it should be. Those three folks right there have been, in my nine experiences, watching local government operation punching bags, uh, unjustly so. They do work behind the scenes, but they are the underpinnings of this local government in terms of its revenue. So uh, I, I would also just like to, and, and Marilyn brings up a good point, there should be priorities. And those priorities should look at first money first, who's making the money flow, how can we make that flow more efficiently into the, into the system. I would like to make just one more point, then I'll be quiet, is that uh, I'm advocating uh, uh, currently for a county administrator. Uh, I, I would hope that doesn't mean we have to go to a freehold position, a uh, form of government, but I think there's some agreeable uh, solution to the problem. The county administrator is someone who is intimately involved with all the departments and makes wise decisions uh, and has the background to do so. Um, ho hopefully we can have that discussion at, a, at another time, but uh, we can't go on as we currently do with this budget process. Thank you. You guys need a PR department. <laughs> yes, we have all you, you, that. You, you, have no you know what's on the front page? The sheriff. Yeah. You know what's on the front page? Yeah. Yeah. The front yeah. page? Yeah. Crime. Yeah. Health. You guys don't get, uh, yeah, people don't know what you do. They don't know how dedicated you are. They don't know how it affects them. And you need, we need, we need to figure out what Lisa was saying, educating, educating our citizens seems like something the League of Women Voters ought to be really interested in helping uh, provide some understanding as Tom said where does the money come from we all want more money in our uh, county then let's show where the money comes from and how it gets into the various departments if they don't step you the sheriff department doesn't even matter because you pay them. You assess taxes uh, about all those people that he has to go out and investigate. I, I'm not. I'm just. I'm not speaking specifically about our sheriff. I'm talking about law justice in general. It is high profile. We've got to figure out ways for people to understand what you do and how well you do it. And it seems like we ought to be able to be helpful with that in this place. And maybe we can think of some other ways to support that. I, I think Karen got to the real point of it in talking about across the board cuts. And if you think about how you manage your own budgets, if all of a sudden you had a reduction in income, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to have to take 17% from my housing and 17% from food and 17% from travel and 17% from my college kids' education fund. You would set priorities. Um, you might look at where you had spent, where you had committed money the year before and say, oh, well, obviously I can't put $500 in my retirement fund, I've got to reduce that to 200 But across the board, cut is, and I apologize to you too, the easy way to do it. Because you don't have to justify choices that you made to either the public or department heads. But it's a really blunt cut. And I don't, you know, I know how I deal with my budget when it fluctuates. Um, I think that consistent cuts and is the really, really crucial issue. I don't know if increases have been consistently or, or similarly consistent when you have increases to a department. Do all departments get 20%? If you're going to be one way, you know, consistent, well, cuts, make you smile. You want to be consistent with increases, uh, or you want to bite the bullet and say, 
we can't prioritize this, we can't do this, we're not meeting this requirement, um, and, and that's painful. Jeannie. So I don't know how many of you were here when I did the presentation on the Community Health Improvement Plan. If you think about that and the seven priority areas and getting those, those problems in our community fixed with prevention and treatment and all the different things that need to be done, economic development, then we wouldn't need as many officers on the road. And we wouldn't need a, as many judges and courts and jail, a new jail. We wouldn't need any of that because we're going to stop it before it happens. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so, you know, get on board with me and, and help me get out there and promote all of these things that are happening, and, and, and they are happening. So we'll, I'll set up to come in and do another presentation later in 2018 that bring you up to There is good news, hopefully, on the horizon. So could I just make a comment? Uh, Maryland, uh, the commissioners are attempting to make uh, adjustments. It's not entirely across the board 17%. They are taking into consideration those uh, departments and elected officials that uh, are receiving uh, uh, a revenue generated. So they are doing that. So it is not just a strictly across the board cut. The other comment that I want to make is that we have three elected officials here today that tell us a really compelling story. And this is not, this is not something that we haven't heard. We heard this when we were doing the budget study, didn't we? That these three departments were, you know, uh, taking um, cuts that was making it very difficult for them to continue to do their job adequately. But if you dive into this and you listen to other elected officials, judges, um, just whatever program, you're going to hear that they can't take the cuts either. So what the commissioners are faced with is this uh, prioritization and balancing. Because I guarantee you on December 4th, there probably are not going to be any elected officials or department heads that are going to be happy. I, I just can you know, I can't see because you're, you're, from what they say they need, you're getting ready to take out $5 million. So it's huge. But if we could hear, if we could hear from the others today instead of just these three, we would hear stories that are tough, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough road ahead. So um, what the solution is, I don't know, but I think part of it is that uh, the public has got to be uh, better informed. That said, the sheriff's budget exceeds them by so much that I would have to see every nickel the sheriff spends before I would say it's okay to lose another person in the their offices. In some place there was a pie chart that showed courts and jails, uh, courts and sheriff take up well over half the county budget. And I think that's the thing. Hold on, girl, let me have that one. I asked Frank today if he has those uh, major categories for the 2018 uh, but and he doesn't at this point. But it, it, it just speaks to our our values, our priorities that we we so spend over half of our budget on police and courts and jails and all that. The Thanks to you said that it was 58 percent, and I I think somewhere it's just about here. Um, I have between like 57 and 62 percent. For the justice, the courts, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Course. for the jails. Including the courts, yeah. jails. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that a factor in the income? How much of that in the sheriff's budget is totally non discretionary? 
Well, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about personnel, personnel is always going to be discretionary. Um, talking about travel, conferences, uh, leased cars for employees, uh, totally how much of it is actually service delivery, non-discretionary, out of that budget? Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't make that decision. Why not? Because then I'm looking they're not making a decision about the health and wealth of the car. A high pursuit vehicle is not supposed to have any more than 150,000 miles on it. Don't they have cars being leased for officers that are pretty much in Yes. And so what's the justification for that? I, I, I don't have the percentages for you. I don't have the dollar amount for you. As far as, as well, how much is, is discretionary? It's, it's these, these are things that the public needs to know. I understand. I understand. I just had a conversation with one of the chiefs and one of the lieutenants today on that very question about they want to say they wanted to have that conversation with me. It's been a tough conversation to have, but we now have people coming and, and wanting to have that conversation and be able to justify questions. What are your questions, Commissioner, about about things in our budget? And I'm going to give them plain laundry list. And, 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 I, and I didn't couch it that way, but, but that is a good way to put it. How much is discretionary? But Terry, they don't have to. An elected official doesn't have to tell you what, what they're going to spend it on. Right. The dollars are given to the elected officials, and they do not have to say how they're going to spend it. There's no way to control. So you can give it to them for personnel, but they can spend it however they Answering wish. the question is different from controlling it. The public has a right to know how their money is going to be spent. That question should be answerable. It right. absolutely should be answerable. It should be answered. Right. I think what uh, what you're saying is in my budget, you anybody who goes through your budget and add up all my discretionary funds, which I have never had, but you know, the travel is dues, registration, sales, whatever they might be. And the commission could do that if they wanted to say, oh, they come up to a thousand dollars. Okay, we're gonna axe off a thousand dollars. Know, on your bottom line, as an elected official, can you? It would be your choice, but it's still right. something you could actually identify, make a point, talk to them about it, and say, "This is what I'm going to do." Right. But ultimately, but those are questions that correct. you ask when you're setting a budget. That's how you set a responsible budget. And the way to run any large organization is to have a healthy balance within all of the things that are required to achieve the service that you have to provide. And that means having a healthy balance between health and that. safety level of service and well. the infrastructure behind it all. It's a level of service as well. All of them are essential services. All of them are mandated services. It's the level of the service. Whether or not you're open during lunch, whether or not you get two-hour wait before you get a response from a police officer, whether or not this person actually goes to jail or, or gets put out um, on probation because we don't have the room in it. level of service. That's true. But it disturbs me when I ask a, what should be at your fingertips questions from the people that are setting the level of services in the budget and you have no way of answering it because you haven't asked it. Before. But could I make a suggestion here? If you want to ask a question about how the discretionary money is being spent, then what you could do is you could say, okay, I have looked at your 2017, the current year funding, and this is what I see that you are spending money on this year. Now, what is the justification that you want that included in your 2018? So you could base it on, this is what you're actually spending it on, and that way you could nail down uh, better Nail down some right. But you can get a better <laughs> it's moving target. Yeah, it is target. But if you were to look at what actually is is has been spent, like for example, why is that uh, individual making uh, that kind of money here in a county with the poverty that that we see? That would be a good question. And then that would lead you into, but the public has to step up and come to these workshops and the public hearing and ask these questions. If, if you, we went in one meeting, one public hearing we went into, and 
nobody was there to answer the questions because on December 4th, it's like, you know, hey, we're done with this because they're worn out. I think we need a video. I think we need all of these meetings to be on video, at least. So they can be shared. Because not everybody, everybody works. Yeah. How can we be at these meetings? Yeah. Everybody's yeah. got other places to be. But, you know, if you had a video, you could see it the next day. You could even yeah. see it as it's happening without having to travel. No. We're really quickly, I think these uh, these uh, I think have to get back to work. So <laughs> thank you very much. Please thank you so much. We've gone over by five minutes, so we have ten minutes worth of discussion, and Randy, you can discuss first. Yeah, I just wanted to bounce off something that the commissioner was saying. She can't give you the, the number of the question you're asking because that is that is something that's interpreted by them. But a number we can give is like the numbers I just gave uh, Brandon today. I can tell you that there's 87 uh, patrol vehicles or vehicles that are listed to patrol or spare or whatever. There's 100 plus vehicles total in the sheriff's department. How many of our discretionary is going to be up to them? I can pay $75,000 in their budget for, for leases uh, for what they, they put in uh, this year for more leases of more vehicles on top of the vehicles that we're already talking about. Uh, uh, what we can do as a commission, I've turned over some of these numbers and stuff that I've given to the legal and voters. But all I can do is go over the budgets, look at it and see my, think for myself what I think can be cut. For example, uh, Mason County Sheriff's Department, uh, 775,000, actually it was 787, but we're saying 775,000 budget for overtime. That's overtime alone. Not 100,000, not 200,000, 787, uh, or 775,000. To me, I think that's excessive. I can see that being cut easily in half if they want to schedule differently. But that, that's, that's something for me, uh, the sheriff may disagree completely that that's discretionary. You know, uh, a, a reduction of 23,500 in their recognition and awards. You know, I see that as, as discretionary. He may not. You know, there's a whole list of them. I went through a whole list of the things that I've come up with now after the last one. Uh, they meet their mark uh, and still have $682,000 more that they can play with with the, the recommendations I'm going to give them. Whether they take them or not makes no difference uh, to our reality. We have to give out a number. And I would like to share one other thing before I go. You know, we have to talk about the state. And uh, the state that, unlike a city, the county is the arm of the state. When the state breathes, we have to, we're the arm that makes the action happen. When you hear the people versus, it's the county paying for it. Uh, it, it, it. It's everything that you touch. If you look at the auditor, she not only does your elections, she also maneuvers all the money for within the county for all the departments and, and all the payrolls. You cannot do the property correctly and make sure everybody pays their, their, their fair share unless you have the assessor out doing their stuff. The treasurer takes in the money from everything and everybody in the world out here, including your courts, including your, your fire department stuff. But then you have to go down and remember the sheriff's department, they're not just standalone. Everybody they touch, not only do they have to catch them, touch them, investigate them, they also have to hold them. But then you also have to prosecute them. Then not only do you have to prosecute them, you have judges and you have clerks that are all in, in form of the part of that. Then you have to defend them because the state says that now you only have 12 cases, so now they'll give us $90,000, but our bill is a million dollars. They don't give us a million to, to, to defend them. But then it goes on. You want your clean water. You want your building departments, uh, a corner, and how important the corner is. Uh, of course, we have our HR. You have your parks. You have your facilities. But, uh, the list goes on and on. All that is being done in Mason County with a budget that's smaller than the North Mason School District. Why that's is that? Because that's what the budget is. That's all the money that's available. Why are we taking a, in more revenue? A county can only increase their revenue by 1%. Okay. Is that Tim Iman? Actually, I believe it was. Uh, that was way before I came in, but I believe it was Tim, Tim Iman. So yes, we can only increase it by 1%. That's are we looking lot. for more sources of revenue? Constantly. Every none day. Of us, none of us is paying enough in tax. Absolutely. So it's the same too. <laughs> what are two things you're looking for for more? Well, <laughs> for me, I, I know in, in my district, I, I'm kind of way over the top of trying to bring businesses in, and it's working. We're getting more, more expansion. The only reason why I say that is because those are monies that are not accounted for right now. That is on top of 
uh, our current mechanism that, that we're getting in. That's one revenue stream. We're trying to do whatever we can to make it so more businesses come in so we can collect more uh, uh, in the way of sales taxes. That's another revenue stream that the county does have and that does come in. Uh, you know, there's others. It's not your property taxes that pays for it. You know, that's a percentage of the overall for what the county brings in. That's not everything you get. If I understand what you were talking about going through the sheriff's budget, if the commission decides 628000 is discretionary, they don't have to agree. You could just say, we've decided this is money you don't need to spend. We will cut your budget by 628000 And then his office would be left to decide which of that really was discretionary and which of it they needed to adjust to pay for. So okay. you could do that if you wanted without that, 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 that is what we do. Yeah. We don't okay. have any other option because we can't tell him what to cut. No, but, right, right. And, but it's cut as 1.2 million already. What I'm saying is I have above this another 600 plus thousand yeah. in my, my perception where they can do those cuts without laying off one single deputy or corrections officer. Yeah. But again, because I have an opinion, it's nothing except for we as a commission will make a decision how much money goes to them. It means one third of the decision. That's what it means. That's what it means. Yeah. When you say the sheriff's department and so on get have fifty eight percent of the budget, does that factor in the income that they get from the courts? The money that comes in? Fines and judgments. Yeah, and the fifty eight percent It doesn't. Yeah. Go ahead. That's just expenditure. That's expenditure, so there is an income from the court system. Is right. that factored in with what the county and does? Most of that income comes in district court. What? That is, you, that's district court. You don't see much income coming. You don't see any income coming in superior court. It's district court for the fines of the, of the tickets and that's something. And the jail and all? The jail doesn't have any income. It used to, but it's not anymore this year. We used to get swept in certain funds, uh, but the sheriff has decided not no longer to house as many inmates in that jail, and we don't take in those swept in certain funds anymore. And they're not charging fifty dollars for a phone call. Well, that part I they don't get the money for yeah. that. Most that's some other that's privatizing. Yeah. I don't but, think it's worth it. Well. I don't know, but all the money that comes in from the district court, I don't even think the money pay for the clerk's office. No, and that is one of the fallacies that we've discovered in doing some of our law and adjustment work is that there is a perception that the courts pay for themselves, and that's why some of the fines and judgments are where they are. But it doesn't work. People can't pay. So the interest goes up, and things go to collections, and that sort of thing. And it doesn't help the county to be tough on crime in that way. Same with those taxes you think you're paying, it's not going to the county either. The marijuana tax and stuff like that, because it's a little teeny sliver. But yet, the county does all the work. It's just what it is. Okay, is there anything else? We have three minutes left. Well, I was just trying to find you. Well, sure. So, my name's Constance Simpson. So, is there uh, some kind of, it seems to me what we're always doing as citizens is that also is these kind of like fits and starts of interest and in what should be done. This seems to be a long, ongoing issue, and I would hope that the league could take this on over a long term period of time, really looking at it all the time, do not depend on, it doesn't have to be an approved county uh, committee. And I think what's really interesting to look at is also the amount of money that Mason County gets from the state and federal governments to do certain things. And I really would also like to look at the debt load and how much that is over time. All these things need to be really, really looked at in depth. And it's not going to be just one budget cycle. And one interesting thing is you go on OFM, the Office of Financial Management, they will have by county how much money. So the last time I looked for uh, Mason County, for every one dollar that Mason County, you know, gave in taxes to the state, we got a dollar, I think it was eighty two or a dollar eighty six back. So when we complain about government also 
taking all of our money, we don't get anything, we have these mandated services. We are getting some financial help and we have had some huge projects in this country and that have been paid for by other tax dollars and our tax dollars. It's not free money. When I say to other people, oh, well, we need to get a grant for that. That's grant dollars of coming from tax. I think that's under support services department is the, the grants that we get. All the right. Public health health. So constant. Constant. How does when you go to OFM and they show you county by county? Yeah. How do we compare with other counties? Oh, it's of similar. Of similar. No, we're right up there. We're usually between two and number two and four, and the last like twenty years of getting um, monies. But that's not monies that are coming to the county always. Some are right. going, they're, they're, they're salmon enhancement projects, they're going right. to a, a non Or they're, they're, they're the DOT, the Transportation Department for uh, Road. Any more comments? Yes, uh, yeah, just a couple of comments. Uh, thank you, Constance, for saying what you said. I mean, this is a long-term, ongoing activity, and I think where we fell short, <laughs> was after we finished our last budget study, kind of burn out. Yeah, burn out. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, mission and accomplished. So, That's what you think. And, and now, so, now we don't have a word. And yeah, well, except I, I think the other part of that is that trying to understand the kind of budget really is a big job. I mean, as Randy just kind of ran through of, uh, an example of how things are related. That really is true, and we, you know, it takes a lot of time to kind of get your arms around what is really happening with the budget. Um, and just to reflect what Connie was saying earlier about the league being, you know, uh, helping with educating the public, I do think that is a job that we have. But first. We have to educate ourselves, right? <laughs> uh, so all that is to say, uh, you know, we probably need to roll up our sleeves and, and uh, dig in okay. if we're going to really try to understand what's going on and how to be in real help to um, our county in total, all the elected officials, including the, the commissioners who came today. And on that future note, sorry Michelle, sorry to pick you up, but I've declared this meeting adjourned. <laughs>